experiences with us over the telephone. We had parents of older autistic children, many of them now adults, thanking us for creating the organization. As we were determined to show a positive side of autism in order to rebalance the way people thought about autistic individuals, many people reached out either to participate or tell us their story. But these sentiments were not universal. The ABA community in Canada was extremely outspoken against the project and boycotted all of our lectures. The publicity was enormous. Television to front page news in one of Canada's national newspapers called Redefining Autism. Autism acceptance in this article was now wrongly portrayed as a movement that does nothing for their autistic child or children. ABA activists were going on the radio stating things like, it's okay that Estee lets her child stay up until 2 in the morning. And the CFRB news anchor couldn't understand how I wouldn't want to cure Adam of his autism. <laughs> oh, and this is uh, Wendy Roberts. I took her to task on that quote. She and I do talk. <laughs> and uh, she says she was inappropriately quoted, which shows how the media likes to um, portray autism, perhaps. I criticized the National Post for not interviewing one autistic person for the article, and there were so many present at our opening. In response to this, they published one letter by our autistic board member, Brian uh, Henson, against three other letters from the ABA parents who said, there is no joy in autism. So what did these parents mean? That they truly found no joy in their autistic children or that the child was a joy but not the autism? How could parents discriminate between autism and their child so easily, I thought? In all the accounts I've read from autistic individuals, they say autism is part of who they are, the way they see and think about the world. While many of the symptoms of being autistic may not be pleasurable, say anxiety for instance, they do not wish to lose the attributes of being autistic despite the challenges. The letters, in my view, illustrate the great divide in thinking about autism, the way many non-autistics view it versus how autistics live it. Despite what us autistics say, authorities from government schools, charities, and research teams see autistics as inherently unreliable sources about autism. This is why the Autism Acceptance Project feels it is very important to have autistic and non-autistic people working together on our board of directors and committees. We all have to learn how to accommodate autistic people so that they can participate Maybe through providing questions ahead of time so autistics can write the responses in advance. Maybe a webcam. We have to make this work if we are to garner any accurate measures in accommodating and educating autistic individuals. As the Autism Acceptance Project evolves, we are committed to ongoing projects and advocacy that seek the answers to the question, what kinds of help do autistics need in order to succeed and to contribute to society as autistic people? So I want to just talk about how the media portrays autism and how it affects the way we think about it. Walter Lippmann, a journalist who died in 1974 and a critic of the media said, the subtlest and most pervasive of influences are those which create a repertory of stereotypes. We are told about the world before we see it. We imagine most things before we experience them. And those preconceptions, unless education has made us acutely aware, govern deeply the whole process of perception. I certainly had my own preconceptions about autism prior to Adam's diagnosis. In fact, when I heard the word in association with Adam, I denied that he was autistic at all. All I could picture was this child sitting alone in the room, rocking himself back and forth in a corner. And while this is not our experience, and maybe for some other autistic children, it is not the sole experience. Unfortunately, the media play upon the fear and these preconceptions, and we hear about the autism epidemic every day. This is from the paper, which I'll cite in a moment, called Three Reasons Not to Believe in the Autism Epidemic. 
Is Adam part of an epidemic? Is he afflicted, diseased, and suffering? He doesn't appear to be, although either others insist that he must be. We know that Lauren Wing articulated this triad of impairments in areas of communication, socialization, repetitive interests, and play as recently as 1980, and that autism was not added to the DSM-IV until 1993. We have become aware that many autistic adults living today were once diagnosed with other things, be it schizophrenia, mental retardation, emotional disturbances. Many adults on the spectrum with whom I talk were subjugated to institutional institutions and given psychotropic medications or they were mainstreamed and called weird. Recently, Dr. Roy Greenker, a professor of anthropology and a father of an autistic girl, Isabel, contradicted the autism epidemic belief in his book, Unstrange Minds, Remapping the World of Autism. He said, epidemic is a powerful concept it implies danger and incites fear, calling up associations with plagues that could sweep through the streets, something contagious in the air you breathe or in the food you eat, threatening the ones you love. With autism, the label of epidemic sounds both frightening and tragic. Think about it. How many people are diagnosed with mental retardation today? I don't, I don't see very many. I mean, I, there was a child, Casey, down my street, and he jumped up and down and flapped his hands, and he was considered mentally retarded in those days. It was about 30 years ago. Greenker notes that there seems to be a corresponding drop in these old, overgeneralized diagnoses. It seems we have evolved to maybe a more refined diagnosis, for better or for worse, it is my feeling that a better understanding of autism can be beneficial for autistic individuals. If, however, an increased awareness and labeling leads to more stereotypes, bias, and segregation, we are only moving backwards. Using the word epidemic to call attention to something for the purpose of gaining audiences or money is not appropriate. Selling epidemics only incites more trepidation among school boards, programs, and perhaps influences others to avoid people like my Adam. How do charities choose to thus represent autism? Not all charities, but some. I found this quote from the Nuremberg Diary where Hermann Goering was quoted saying, the people can always be brought to the bidding of the leaders. That is easy. All you have to do is tell them they are being attacked and denounce the pacifists for lack of patriotism and exposing the country to danger. It works the same way in any country. This is also true, I find, for the political landscape of autism. We are being attacked by the autism epidemic, we are told, and to accept autism is the equivalent to pacifism, and the pacifists or neurodiversity supporters, meaning supporters of neurological difference, are being portrayed as people who are exposing their children and other children to greater risk. Our leaders today in autism are autism advocates or directors of autism organizations. Today we have the very high profile Bob and Suzanne Wright, founders of Autism Speaks, a very new organization, which has now subsumed Cure Autism Now in NAR with a total annual